Welcome everyone to Monday Match Analysis. I'm Gil Gross. Daniil Medvedev is Miami Open champion. He adds to his ever-growing collection of trophies with number 19. All at different tournaments, 18 of them on hard courts. It's another huge hard court title for Daniil Medvedev. He beat Yannick Sinner in the Miami Open final in straight sets. 7563. I am excited to break it down. But first, let's contextualize this unbelievable Daniil Medvedev run. He made five finals in a row. He won four titles. I think it's going to end in Monte Carlo. So I don't think I'm doing this prematurely. I don't think so. So let's talk about this run as if it's over. Yeah, maybe it keeps going, but I think it's over. Let's talk about it. Is it his best ever? Five finals in a row, four titles. Is that his best ever? Well, there's some stiff competition. In 2019, he made six finals in a row. Washington, Canada, Cincinnati, U.S. Open, St. Petersburg, Shanghai. There were three titles in there. End of 2020 into 2021. There was an offseason in between. But this was the best win streak of his career. He won Paris. He won the Tour Finals. He won the ATP Cup. He went to the Australian Open Final, lost to Novak Djokovic. It was a 20-match win streak, longest of his career. But it was all big events. Tour Finals. Paris. ATP Cup, where you're playing a lot of good opponents. Australian Open. So in that 20-match win streak, remarkably, he had 12 top 10 wins. Insane. I actually remember being the number the number being 13, but when I checked before this video, it was it was 12. So uh, maybe I made a counting mistake. It was either 12 or 13. All right. It was unbelievable. So was this one the best? It's hard to say. 2019, he made six finals in a row, which is obviously better than five. Plus, you had a major in there in the U.S. Open, which is pretty significant. 2020 to 2021, more Top 10 competition, bigger events, three titles. Uh, but again, this was a little bit longer and this was four titles. So here's what this one has going for it. He has never won four titles in five events. By that metric, it's the best run of his career. I don't know, uh, though. Between the three, if you guys feel strongly, you can uh, jump in in the comments. Here's something that is inarguable. He's on pace for the best season of his career. He just tied his career high in titles already with four. And easily, he's at a career high win percentage right now. 30 and three is his record on the season. That's a 90% win percentage. That's through the roof, off the charts. Unbelievable what Daniil Medvedev has done since January. Let's get into the final. The level wasn't through the roof. It wasn't a classic. At the start of the final, especially, the level wasn't all that high, but it looked like uh, certainly it was going to be a, a really even match. What happened was Medvedev got better. Sinner got worse. He got more tired as the match went on. And obviously, we'll get into detail in that respect. So it, it went from a match. At no point was it an incredible match, but it certainly seemed competitive. And then it started to uh, get a little bit tilted. Medvedev's strengths were too strong in this match. His strengths were too strong. First serve and shot tolerance. Those are the main things that stood out to me on the court as, you know, what was kind of shifting things to Medvedev in Medvedev's favor. And at the end of the day, those are what Medvedev is best at first serve and shot tolerance. It's a good descri description of what he does so well. And by the way, those things are not often packaged together in the same player. And that's why we've talked a lot about the uniqueness of Daniil Medvedev, uh, a play style that really didn't exist until he and Alexander Zverev and Hubert Hercog Koch uh, came along. Although you can make an argument that Andy Roddick was kind of in the same ilk. So first, I want to talk about rallies. Then I want to talk about serve. Then I want to talk about some tactics. 
and then we'll get into Yannick Sinner and kind of what he needs to improve in order to beat Daniil Medvedev. He's now 0-6 against Daniil. Or conversely, Medvedev is 6-0 and against Sinner. For some reason, the statements are the same, but they sound a little bit different. Let's talk about the rallies. Not even close for Medvedev. Rallies, five or more shots, 26-11 to for Daniil. 26-11. And this is also why Sinner only won 32% of his second serve points for the match. It wasn't because Sinner was getting attacked on his second serve. Medvedev rarely is offensive on his second return. It was because he struggled so immensely in the longer rallies. That's the kind of point that was being played on his second serve. And that's why he only won 32% of his second serve points. And I think he got broken four times, if I remember correctly. Yeah, uh, so Sinner got broken four times in a two-set match. You're going to be behind the eight, eight ball. You're probably going to lose in straights if you're playing Daniil Medvedev. And you get broken four times in two sets. The biggest culprit of this was the backhand and backhand consistency. Now, first of all, before I get into more detail on that, this says a lot about Medvedev's backhand. Sinner has what I would say is a top 10 backhand in, in men's tennis. I don't think that's bold. I think that's pretty consensus that Sinner has a top 10 two-handed backhand in men's tennis. But every time these two have played, or at least without a shadow of the doubt, the last two times these two have played— Matches that have been big finals that I've analyzed closely and charted on a point-by-point -point basis. The backhand and backhand exchanges have been a nightmare for Sinner. Medvedev has jumped all over those guys. It says a lot about Daniil's backhand. If we regard Sinner's two-hander as highly as we do, yet Medvedev just crushes in this pattern. What does that say about Daniil's backhand? Well, Medvedev's backhand, I've been very clear. I think it's uh it's tied it's tied for first. It's tied for first with Novak. When I made my Hulk player, I chose Medvedev for backhand consistency. But of course, tennis doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's a relationship. You never hit a backhand in isolation. The only shot you hit in isolation is the serve. So let's talk about Medvedev's ball, and I think that it hurts Sinner's backhand. Medvedev's ball stays very low, and Sinner got tired of using his legs. Sinner has to stay down with the ball. He has to get down low to deal with Medvedev's cross-court backhand. He doesn't have a slice to deal with it. Sinner hit 96% topspin for the match. That includes forehands, but nonetheless, it shows you how little he slices his backhand. Not a shot in his arsenal. And it just feels like time and time again, Sinner has to go down low to hit his two-hander against Medvedev's cross-court backhand. And not only can he not really attack off of it, but he misses it too much. The backhand stats were as followed. Medvedev, four winners to six unforced errors. Sinner, one winner to 16 unforced errors. So to hammer that home, Sinner hit 16 unforced errors. Medvedev hit six on the backhand side. Those are not Infosys stats. Those are ATP Media Tennis TV stats. We can even zoom in on the most important game of the match. 5-6 in the first set. The first set felt really, really important. It certainly didn't seem like Yannick, who was already looking exhausted at this point, was going to be able to win this match in three sets. So 5-6, you're trying to get to the tie break if you're Sinner. In hindsight, most important game of the match, they played two backhand and backhand cross courts that Medvedev won in this game. Both ended on Sinner on forced errors. So... This was true in Rotterdam. It was true again here. The backhand consistency is so tilted that it's a difficult thing for Yannick to overcome. 
he has to be able to just stay more solid on the backhand. And I think the slice would help with that. And I also think, in fairness, having a, a day where his legs were feeling a little bit better would have also helped because it just seemed like a lot of energy was required for Yannick to get down low to hit his two-hander off of Medvedev's flat and low delivery. It was asking a lot. Uh, the other the other item is that Sinner feels more pressed to try to go down the line to try to change direction. He tried to do that in this match. I called for it in the preview for him to try to do it in this match. But by doing that, he is going for the more difficult shot. He is trying to hit over the higher part of the net. He is trying to hit into less court with the baseline uh, closer to the to the contact point when you're going down the line. So that in itself will also lead to more mistakes. In general, backhand aside, Sinner's legs started to look very unstable whenever the passages of play got physical. And at first, watching the match, I thought it was just the heat. But after the match, Yannick talked about not feeling well. Uh, here's some direct quotes from Sinner. I woke up not in the best possible way. I felt a little bit sick. With the heat, when you run a lot, it gets a little bit worse and worse. When the rallies were long today, I was struggling the point or two points after. So when you look at this number, rallies 5 plus, 26 to 11 for Medvedev. It, it, it's, uh, it was mostly about errors and it was mostly about one player having strong legs and the other player not. Uh, because Sinner's movement started to look very, very shaky. And the longer the match went, the worse it started to look. Now let's talk about Medvedev's serve. And how Daniil handled the conditions. Because I mentioned this earlier, but I thought Daniil was feeling the heat as well in the first set. It, it got better. And uh, that's what Medvedev said. In fact, Medvedev said that uh, he was actually feeling pretty badly. And then he kind of looked across the net and saw that Yannick was suffering a lot himself, and that made Daniil feel a lot better, which is often how it works. It's a good feeling to look across the net and see your opponent suffering. Very good feeling. Oftentimes, that'll give you a little boost. It certainly did here for Medvedev. Uh, but also, I asked Medvedev about playing in heat and humidity before his first round match. It was one of my questions to him in press. And Daniil said that he often feels pretty bad on the court. You know, he doesn't like how it makes him feel, but he plays pretty well in it. He thinks that he he wins a lot. It, it helps him in that respect. He also told me that he went full body cramping after losing to Hercotch last year at the Miami Open. 20 minutes after the match, full body cramps. So it can get to him. There's no doubt. I mean, we've seen him cramp many a time, including in the Australian Open final in the third set against Rafa Nadal. But if he's not cramping, there's a lot of things that are positive for Daniil Medvedev. Big big thing is his serve. The serve is just a great weapon of energy conservation. And here's how it played out statistically. On Sinner service games, when Sinner was serving, 60% of the points were within the 0 through 4 rally length. When Medvedev was serving, 79% of the points were in the 0 through 4 rally length. So essentially, if you take a sample size of 5 points, Sinner is playing 2 extended rallies on his serve. Medvedev is only playing 1 extended rally. And that's a big difference. It's a really big difference. Unreturned serves in total. Medvedev was at 40%. Sinner was at 25%. If both players are struggling physically, which was the case in the beginning of the first set, especially, and midway through the first set, who is it going to hurt more? Who will be hurt by it more? Undoubtedly, the player who will be hurt by it more is the player who is struggling, or sorry, the player who is having to play physical rallies on serve. That's the player who is going to be hurt by it. Medvedev could avoid those rallies. I talked about in the preview 
uh, Yannick Center directionals. And how in Rotterdam, Medvedev hit basically three backhands for every one time he hit a forehand. And how that was doing two things. One, it was just perpetuating that backhand to backhand pattern, which Sinner was losing so often. Uh, the second thing it was doing was it wasn't giving Sinner anything to attack because it's very hard to get an attackable ball off of Medvedev's backhand. It's a lot easier off of his forehand, which doesn't stay quite as low, is hit with more topspin, and is not quite as great a shock-absorbing or pace-absorbing shot. Sinner did it. Sinner made Medvedev hit more forehands in this match. Medvedev for the match hit 90 forehands and 94 backhands, so it was pretty close to 50-50. But Medvedev really answered the bell on his forehand side. Medvedev went big. He averaged 78 miles per hour on his forehand. One mile per hour faster than Sinner. At first, there were a lot of errors on the Medvedev forehand. And you know my take on Medvedev's aggressiveness. I think normally he's a better player when he's ultra patient. And when Medvedev is very aggressive, that's usually when he actually makes errors. And I don't think it suits him. I don't think it's his best play style. In the beginning of the match, there were a lot of errors. It actually cleaned up. He completely cleaned it up. And the pace remained high, but the errors went away, and it turned into a really high-level forehand performance from Medvedev in this match. At first, I thought it was because of the heat. I thought it was because, well, Daniil doesn't really want to run, so he's going to go bigger on the forehand because uh, he doesn't want to play defense. Jim Courier asked Medvedev about it for Tennis Channel, and Daniil basically said, first of all, it wasn't tactical. It wasn't really a plan. Uh, but he said subconsciously, he, he doesn't really want to let Yannick get comfortable. So that's probably why he feels the need to go bigger because he doesn't want to let Sinner set his feet or give Sinner time, which makes sense. Sinner's one of the most powerful ball strikers in the world when he gets time on the ball. Of course, you don't want to give him time on the ball because while Medvedev might not be intimidated by the power of 99% of the players on tour. Sinner's a guy, he probably does respect his power enough to actually be a little bit intimidated by it and go bigger. I kind of go back to this as the key to Medvedev's success this year. In the past, adding speed to the forehand usually goes horribly for Medvedev. It's not his game, but he's more comfortable doing it now. When he needs to go big off of that wing, and as far as I can tell, the, the big change was with the string technology. Maybe there were some, twe some tweaks on technique, but he is playing with a softer string that gives him more power out of his technology, out of his racket. So I think that is making the difference. I got to own up to being wrong about this because this is an area where I've always felt, okay, Medvedev's pace generation on the forehand is a weakness. And when it comes to any weakness, you start to think about, is it going to get better? And my opinion was always, no, it's not going to get better. Not with that technique, not with that upper body strength, not at that advanced age in his career. I forgot about that factor. I forgot about the technology factor where... Maybe he doesn't need to get any physically stronger because I knew he wasn't gonna. I knew he wasn't really gonna, you know. I mean, he's he's 27 years old. He's not gonna suddenly uh, start to look like Jan Leonard Struff, all right? I knew that wasn't gonna happen. I knew the technique wasn't gonna really change. I forgot about the technology factor. You know, that that is the area where where he got some extra speed on the forehand. And it was really helpful in this match because Sinner didn't really get the reward that I thought he'd get from changing up the tactic and making Medvedev hit more forehands. He did not get the reward. The payoff wasn't there. You got to credit Daniil for that. Now let's uh, zoom in a little bit on Sinner. The other thing I talked about in the preview is that he needed to mix up his offense. He needed to finish at net. I didn't talk about drop shots, but certainly that's a part of it. Right, Creative finishing against Medvedev's defense because power isn't going to cut it. 
There were plenty of times in this match where where Daniil uh, was very impressive in his defense, in his absorption of center's power from a deep court position. And again, the way you have to deal with that on the other side of the net is you have to finish in the forecourt or you can hit drop shots. Two weeks ago, I was talking two weeks ago today, I was talking about the Indian Wells final and how every time Alcaraz hit a drop shot, it was a winner. I was look, Sinner, I mean Medvedev is very good when he gets to drop shots. So I was so intrigued to see what's gonna happen. Is the Alcaraz drop shot gonna work? Or is Medvedev and, and how talented he is when he gets up to the drop shot, is that gonna be better? No. That didn't matter because it was a winner every time. So what did it matter how good Medvedev was when he got there? He never got there. Two weeks later, we can we can talk about the exact opposite. The drop shot never worked. It was never a winner. He hit seven. Sinner hit seven drop shots in the match. None of them were winners. Four of them he missed in the net. Another two he lost. Uh, there is one point that I don't have charted. So the moral of the story is this. Sinner either lost all seven when he hit a drop shot or six of seven. And I'm not sure exactly which one it is. Now I will say this. Even if Sinner would have had a better chance of winning if he hit zero drop shots in this match, I am very glad that he didn't hit zero drop shots in this match. I can tell you about his execution. I can tell you that his drop shots weren't good. I can tell you that his drop shot is a work in progress. But here's what I'll also tell you. He used to not hit drop shots at all. And Sinner is still in the developmental stage. He is still in the part of his career where it's not really about winning the match today or tomorrow. It's about being the best player in the world two years from now, hopefully. If I'm Sinner's team, that's the mindset here. You're 21. Athletically, there's some growth. The serve is still getting better. And there's still parts of the game like the volley and the slice and the drop shot. It's still, it's still getting better. So it's never going to get better. Here's the point. It's never going to get better if he doesn't hit it. He has to hit it. He has to hit drop shots. Even if it stinks, he's just got to do the right thing and hit it. Because developmentally, it's going to pay dividends in the future. So I will not criticize Sinner for playing the right shot and using that tactic. I will not. I refuse. I will praise him for hitting drop shots. Drop shot needs to get better, though. Or he's going to keep losing to Medvedev. Let's talk about net play. Sinner was 10 of 16 at the net. That's not great. Not awful. Made a great volley on break point at 3-all in the first set. That was great, right? But also hit some bad volleys. Ultimately, I just don't think he was there enough. Given the circumstance. Given how his legs were feeling, given how much he was getting destroyed in extended rallies, 10 of six, 16 is not enough. 16 is not enough. Now, if things were going all right from the baseline, I might say, all right, you know, he, he did his best. But ultimately, if you're getting destroyed from the baseline, you got to be able to get forward more than that. Why wasn't he able to get forward more than 16 times? Well, first of all, here's here's a quirk. Here's an oddity. He only serves in volleys on the ad side. This was true in Rotterdam. And this was true in this match. He, d he did mix in serve and volley, but it's only an option for him on half of the points because he doesn't do it on the deuce side. This is strange. Most players are a little bit more comfortable doing it on the deuce side compared to the ad side. For Sinner, it's the opposite. 
uh, but it takes away his opportunities to serve in volley uh, as much as he potentially could. So that's not good. And if Medvedev was deep into the analytics here, which I'm guessing he was, that means he knew that. And part of serve and volley and what makes it effective is the unpredictability of not knowing what kind of return you sh should be hitting. That's a major weapon of it. And if Medvedev was on the deuce side every time, knowing that Sinner wasn't coming in, it was going to make him, or I should say, allow him to return better. So I don't know what's with that. But I also think it's a movement thing. You know, there wasn't a lot of serve plus approach and Yannick does do a good job of hugging the baseline and taking the ball early. He does not do a good job of recognizing the short ball and moving forward quickly inside the court and just transitioning the net. Like I just, the movement that is so natural for Tsitsipas and Alcaraz and look, there's no better example than Federer and how natural the movement was for him. You know, to be on the baseline, to recognize the short ball, and then to kind of move forward through your approach shot and, and get, get to net. You know, it is a different footwork. It is not the same footwork as, you know, waiting for the ball to come to you on the baseline and, and staying on the baseline. It's a different footwork and it just doesn't look that natural for center right now. So he's got to work on that because I don't think, I think he knows that he wants to come forward more and, I think he has a lot of trouble doing it because it's just uncomfortable for him for a couple of different reasons. That's all I got. I do want to uh, update the, the whole tears thing. You know, I, I like to talk about tears. So let's talk about tears. We're back to how it was for about three years. You know, over two years, it was Medvedev is tier one on hard courts. Is he a tier one player? Full stop. It's a little bit complicated because he he isn't that on all surfaces. Like the other Tier 1 players, which was Djokovic and Nadal. Uh, Djokovic and Nadal were the same across all the surfaces. They were always Tier 1. And Medvedev was surface dependent. So that's kind of how it was for, th for three years. All right. So I don't need to see all that much from Daniil to go right back to that, to go right back to how it was for three years. So after this run, obviously we're back to that. Instead of Nadal, it's Alcaraz, but that's kind of your tier one now. Um, it is, it is Djokovic. It is Alcaraz. And it is Medvedev on hard courts. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I will see you next time.